Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming. I think this is a fantastic conference. And I have to begin by telling you a little secret about me. I love to watch people. I, I'm probably a lot like a, a lot of you. And the thing is, I've worked a lot in different places around the world, so I have to tell you about the most interesting person I've ever watched. Now, this was when I was working down in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. And this guy, he was just amazing. He could mimic almost anybody. He was just this thin, wispy little guy with a big head, so he looked like this sort of upside down exclamation point. And, and what he used to do is, you know, he had a wispy little voice, but the, his name was Neil. The station manager, on the other hand, was this six foot eight, just a hulk of a man, baritone voice. Now what Neil used to like to do is he used to like to mimic Art Brown, the station manager. So when the phone would ring, and ring it, and Neil would pick it up and say, hello, this is Art Brown speaking. So one day the phone rings, Neil picks it up. Hello, this is Art Brown speaking. And it was Art Brown on the other <laughs> end of the line. So Art says, who the hell is this? And Neil says, why Art? This is you. <laughs> I'm so glad you've finally gotten in touch with yourself. <laughs> and so this is actually what we're going to do here today. I'm going to help you get a little bit more in touch with yourself and one of the deepest attributes you have as a human being, and that is your ability to learn. Now, the, the, the funny thing is, so, you know, uh, not too long ago, about a year and a half ago, my husband and I were down in the basement and we were making this thing called a MOOC, right, which is a massive open online course. So I, I was, I had just finished off a book, my publisher's Random House, and they're like, Barb, you've got to be writing op-eds for the New York Times and Washington Post and all these, you know, you got to be doing that. I'm like, no, 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 I'm in my basement, I'm working on a MOOC. And they're like, what's a MOOC? So, so we get this MOOC together, and it's called Learning How to Learn, and it's, it's a, an online course, and anybody can take it, it's free. And, here, and here's the real shocker. So, you know, we make it, and, and here's a recent New York Times article on, it's now the world's largest course. And, uh, and so it, it's the number one most popular course in the world. And it's, we've got over 1.3 million registered users. Uh, and we did it all for less than $5,000 in our basement. So I'm just like, wow. Uh, uh, so I go to Harvard. Harvard invites me to speak. And I, you know, here, little Midwestern engineer, you know, I make good, wow, I'm going to Harvard, and I'm all nervous. And I, I, I go there, and I walked in the room, and it was packed. I mean, there's all these people from Harvard, MIT, and so forth, and I'm like, what the heck? Why are there all these people here? And I come to find out that our one little MOOC, made for less than $5,000, has on the order of the same number of students as all 60 of Harvard's MOOCs put together, made for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. So, so I go, and, and this is totally true, I'm like, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Anybody can do this. And boy, you do not say that around Harvard, right? Uh -uh. But anyway, so the themes of this talk are going to be, first I'm gonna give you a little bit of insight into how we learn, some practical insights from neuroscience and, and from cognitive psychology. And then I'm going to give you a little information about how to use this knowledge to help in the creation of riveting online materials. Now, I have to start by giving you just a little bit of information about uh, my own background. So I grew up uh, moving all over the place, so at least in the US. 
So by the time I hit 10th grade, I lived in 10 different places. Now, the thing is that math in particular is very sequential. And so when I was about seven years old, I was moving from Lubbock, Texas to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and suddenly they were way ahead of me in doing the multiplication tables. And I realized at that time there was just no way I could do math and science. I mean, that, that was it. So I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school science, science and math. And the funny thing is I really am. I'm standing here in front of you as a professor of engineering. So, uh, and, and this is a real deal. I've published in top journals, I, you know, all that kind of thing. But one day, one day one of my students uh, found out about my sordid past as a math flunky. And he said, how'd you do it? How'd you change your brain? And I thought about it. I thought, you know, here, here I was. This is like, this is the last cute picture of me, right? <laughs> so, but I, I was just, I was this little kid and I just, I loved you know, animals and knitting and, I, and I, I always thought, wow, wouldn't it be really awesome if I could learn another language? I grew up in a resolutely monolingual household and you can guess which language that was I spoke. And, and I just thought, wow, well, you know, I really want to learn another language because I can't do math and science. So, you know, what's left for me? Maybe I'll try this. So I didn't have the money to go to college. And so I, I thought, how can I learn another language and maybe even get paid for it? There was one way to do that. And that was to join the army. So you see me here, I'm looking very nervous, uh, about to throw a grenade. And if you knew how clumsy I was, you'd see why I was looking so nervous. <laughs> uh, and I did learn another language. I learned Russian. And so I ended up working out on uh, Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea. You can see here's a bunch of fish. And uh, I'm looking pretty happy because uh, we're going to have some of them for dinner. But anyway. So I learned Russian and I, I just loved new perspectives and, and having new adventures. And so I also ended up uh, down at the South Pole Station in Antarctica and that's where I met my husband. Uh, <laughs> so I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man, which is true. And, uh, but, uh, and we just had our 32nd wedding anniversary on the 1st of February, yes. Uh, uh. So, uh, so I, I, I began to realize something though, and that was with all my love of adventures and new perspectives, I was still being very limited in what I wanted to learn, right? I, will, I only wanted to learn language and things that I was comfortable and familiar with. I remembered looking at the textbooks of the West Point engineers I had worked with in the Army, and I'd look at it and I'd go, man, that just looks, I can't, I can't even fathom how anybody could understand that. And then I thought, but wait a minute, aren't I supposed to be open to new perspectives and new adventures? I mean, why shouldn't I start looking at some of these kind of things? And in fact, as I came up to the time where I was about to get out of the service, I discovered a very interesting fact. And that is, there's not much interest for people whose sole professional expertise is the ability to speak Russian. So I decided when I, when I got out of the service that I would try and retrain my brain, see if I could learn something to do with math and science because I could see that language and culture are very, very important. But math and science and technology are important also, especially in today's world. And so I, I set about age 26, I went to remedial high school algebra and began to try to work my way upwards. And it was very slow and it was very difficult. But if I had known then what I know now, I could have made it so much more easy on myself. So as I began 
years later, trying to answer that student's question, how did I change my brain? I began, you know, I, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I wrote him a little email as an answer, and then I thought, you know, I should write a book about this. So I started working on a book, and I wrote a manuscript, because I, I like to write books, and, uh, and then, there's this thing, I don't know, do you know this? Uh, it's called ratemyprofessors.com. And you can go in and you can see how professors are rated for uh, how good a teacher they are. So I went to ratemyprofessors.com and it turns out there's a way, if you really fiddle with it, you can download the best teachers of large classes in, in pretty much any subject you might name. So it might be math, science, uh, physics, chemistry. So I went and I downloaded like the top two, three hundred uh, professors who are often the best researchers as well. And I, I got their emails and I hear there were thousands and thousands of, um, of these professors and I emailed them all and I asked them, would you like to take a look at my manuscript? And shocking percentages said yes. So here I got, you know, just uh, probably close to a thousand uh, responses from people who had read the manuscript. And here's one thing that I found very surprising. They often, there was like this sort of um, a secret shared handshake that they had. They would, they, they would use metaphor and analogy and story to help convey some of the really difficult ideas that they had that they were trying to teach in math and science. And so knowing then, or knowing now what I, I wish I had known uh, before, it turns out that when you teach something using a metaphor, you're actually uh, activating, this is called neural reuse theory, you're activating some of the same neural circuits to understand this very difficult, or the very easy concept of the metaphor, as to understand the very difficult concept itself. But a lot of these really top professors were embarrassed to reveal that they use metaphor and analogy. Why? Because it, uh, they get attacked by other more mundane professors around them, right? You're dumbing down the material and so forth. But it's not true. Now, knowing what we know from neuroscience, it's simply not true. So, so as I began you know, putting this all together, I reached out not only to these top professors, but I reached out to top uh, neuroscientists, to top cognitive psychologists, and of course, I myself have been a professor and, and researched uh, in the field of engineering education for several decades. So what I'm going to share with you today are some of the key ideas and key points from what I found. Now, the, the, the brain, as we know, is incredibly complicated. But fortunately, we can simplify its operation to two fundamentally different modes. The first I'll call, I'll call the focused mode. And you turn your attention to something, boom, it's on, right? So you look at a book, you look at me, and, and your focused attention is on. But the second is called, I call it, the diffuse mode. And diffuse mode is more a relaxed neural set. There's actually a set of some 24 that we know of now, neural resting states, the most famous of which is the default mode network. So, so to the default mode or diffuse mode networks, you, you activate those like you're standing in the shower, not thinking about anything in particular. Have you ever noticed how many times you'll have an idea in the shower? And, or you're going out for a walk or riding a bicycle or getting on a bus or maybe falling asleep. These are all times when you can't really turn on diffuse mode resting states but they'll come of their own volition. And that's when you often have insights about difficult challenges, problems that you've been trying to figure out. So to better understand some of these, uh, uh, these two different modes, we're going to use a metaphor. <laughs> 
And so the metaphor we're going to use is that of a pinball machine. And you probably remember how a pinball machine works. You just pull back on the plunger and a ball goes boinking around, bouncing around on the rubber bumpers and that's how you get points. So what you do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this pinball machine and I'm gonna plop it right down on a human brain. So there's the human brain and you can see here there's the little nose on the top and the ears on the side. And I'm going to plop this pinball machine right there in the brain. So there you go. OK, it's plopped in there. Now you can see this is the analogy for the focused mode of the brain. And those little rubber bumpers are quite close to one another. So when you're thinking in focus mode, as it turns out, you're kind of following along the pathways that have already been laid. For example, if you already know how to do multiplication, which of course I didn't when I was seven years old, your mind has some patterns that have already been laid about multiplication. So when you think a thought, like you're trying to solve 24 times 72, it moves along smoothly in those patterns that have already been laid and that's how you solve the problem. But what if you're trying to figure something out that you've never encountered before? So it'd be like you've done multiplication, you're very comfortable with multiplication, but you have never encountered division before. How do you even get to the new pattern? You don't even have the new pattern there. You don't know what it's shaped like, what it's supposed to do. I mean, how do you even get there? It turns out that that second brain mode is what you often do when you're learning something new. You often involve the use of this second way of thinking, the diffuse mode. So when you think a thought, it takes off, moves along, and, and, and it moves, you can see how, see how it ranges a lot more widely before it hits a rubber bumper? Those bumpers are more widely spaced. And so you, you can't think along a specific rigid pattern like you can in the focus mode, but you can at least get to a new location in your brain that allows you to think about a problem or a new concept in a different way. So the trick about focused and diffuse mode is you can be in either the focus mode or the diffuse mode, but you can't be in both modes at the same time unless you're a Buddhist monk with lots of training and all these kinds of things. So what that means is you're focusing really hard to solve a problem. You focus, 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 and then and you can't figure it out. So you focus, your tendency is, and this is, if you look at my old books from when I was trying to learn like uh, the uh, rudimentary trigonometry, you'll see all these dimples in the book pages. And it's because I would get so frustrated that I'd take a fork and I'd just stab my book with a fork, right? Because, but haven't we all shared those kinds of experiences? Don't our students and our coworkers and those we're trying to train, those, we've all had these kinds of experiences. And it relates to the fact that you're, for example, in this kind of a focused mode, you're here, you wanna be here, you keep focusing harder and harder, but you're just stuck right there and you don't realize you're stuck there. The only way you can actually finally get here is to stop it, close the book, put away the video, whatever it is you're, that you're stuck on, walk away, and that will allow you to access some of this very different type of thinking so you can approach that problem when you come back in a new and fresh way. So, so you might be thinking, okay, well, we got us here another professor and she's just giving us some good academic stuff. And how can we really apply this in real life? So I have to let you know some of my favorite characters in history who figured out ways to apply this in real life. And they used it to create some very, very interesting things. So the first one is this guy, Salvador Dali. 
uh, one of the greatest of the surrealist painters. And you can see him, he's, he's, he was like the original wild and crazy guy. He was Madonna and Lady Gaga before there was Madonna and Lady Gaga. That is his pet ocelot, Babu. And what Dali used to do was when he had some kind of difficult problem with his, uh, with his painting, he'd sit in a chair with a key in his hand, relax, relax, relax away. And he'd be loosely thinking about some problem he was trying to resolve, relax, and just as he relaxed so much that he'd fall asleep, the key would fall from his hand, the clatter would wake him up, and off he'd go. He'd take those ideas from the, the diffuse mode back into the focus mode where he could, he could refine and analyze them. So you might think, that's, that's interesting, but it's, you know, it's an artist, and I actually have to deal with technology, so what's here for me? Turns out, anybody know who this guy is? Thomas Edison, yes. Uh, uh, so Edison was uh, one of the most prolific inventors in history, and what Edison used to do, he used to, when he had some kind of really difficult technological problem to resolve, sit in a chair with ball bearings in his hand, relax, relax away. And just as he'd relax so much that he'd fall asleep, ball bearings would fall from his hands, the clatter would wake him up, at least according to legend, and he'd take those ideas from the diffuse mode back into the focus mode where he could refine and analyze them. So the lesson for us in all of this is, is people throughout history, great and not so great, known and not known, have used these kinds of different modes, whether, whether consciously or unconsciously, to help them resolving problems. So, uh, so when someone you know, like if you have your daughter is sitting in and solving a division problem, to her, she's using these same kinds of creative approaches as people throughout history have used. And she's being as creative with her problem solving, even if millions of other people have solved these problems before, as, as people throughout history have been creative. So, so uh, I, what I'd like to do now is I'd like you to, you've already met someone, so turn to that person, and I'd like you to team up and explain the difference between focused and diffuse mode. So take about two minutes here. On your mark, set, go. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's keep going here. Okay, so I know what you're saying again is another one of these academicians, you know, with these great ideas that are actually not practical in real life because she's saying it takes time to do this. So you have to go back and forth between the modes to learn something, but who has time for that when you're in business and you've got people who are working hard and it, you just don't have time to dilly-dally around. And more than that, more than that, you may like to procrastinate. <laughs> so as it turns out, procrastination is really the biggest problem for a lot of people. Because you can be working on something, focus on it, and then take your mind off, work on something else while you're waiting for that background processing to take place. And you can, but you gotta get to working on it in the first place in order for any processing to take place. So uh, this is a funny thing. In this massive open online course, I hear back from lots of people, like hundreds of emails a day, um, and one of the, the things that they absolutely love most about the MOOC is what I'm going to tell you next. So I think you might be very interested to hear about some of these ideas. Turns out that when you procrastinate, when you even think about something you'd really rather not do, 
It activates a part of the brain known as the insular cortex that allows you to experience pain. So you actually feel pain when you think about something you don't want to do. So what do you do about that? You, you want to do something to turn off the negative stimulation, right? So procrastination is really just a habit. And let's look a little more carefully at how this habit happens. You get, first you think about something you'd really rather not do, and you get this unhappy feeling, right? You get a pain in your brain, and so you turn your attention to something that's more pleasant, and the result is that you feel happier almost instantly. But you do this once, you do it twice, no big deal. You do it very often, and it is just like an addiction. It actually can have long-term negative consequences in your life. So since I'm an engineer, we will cut right to the chase. How do you handle procrastination? The easiest way is using the Pomodoro technique. This was invented by an Italian, Francesco Cirillo, in the early 1980s. And it's very simple. Pomodoro is Italian for tomato, of course. All you have to do, turn off all distractions, so no little uh, alarms on your, on your computer, nothing from your cell phone, turn off all sounds, all buzzers, and set your timer for 25 minutes. That's what uh, Francesco Cirillo did, was he had a little tomato-shaped timer as, as what he was uh, using to kind of convey these ideas. And then just focus for 25 minutes. Anybody can focus for 25 minutes. Now, if you're like me, you might do things like this. You begin focusing. After about three minutes, it go, your brain goes like this. Oh my word, I've only done three minutes. I've got 22 minutes to go. I can't do it. And then you just let that thought drift right on by and you return your attention because you're not supposed to be perfect. You just do as well as you can during this time. And then at the end, you reward yourself. So maybe play a song that you like. Maybe uh, have a little bit of chatting with friends, cup of coffee, uh, web surf a little bit. What you're really doing is, we have always had this tendency to think that learning only occurs when you are concentrating and focusing. But now you're beginning to understand it occurs as well when you're relaxing. So by focusing intently for a period of time and then relaxing for a period as well, you can go back and forth between these modes and it can help you learn more effectively. So the only last little tool or trick for you is don't focus on finishing a task. Just remember your whole goal is to focus intently as you can for 25 minutes. You don't even want to think about the task you're working on because that activates the pain. You just do it, right? And that gets you into uh, what Chiksai Mahali calls the state of flow. Now, so good learning is a lot like baking a cake. Uh, you, you can't, I mean, a cake has lots of different ingredients to it, and good learning has lots of different ingredients. So I'm going to touch on just a few of those other little ingredients. And the way I'm going to do it, usually, I I explain these ideas. Uh, but what I'm going to do here, since we're involved in online learning, I'm going to give you a little snippet from the MOOC so you'll see how I teach about this important new idea using the strategies of online learning. So this new idea relates to the importance of sleep in learning. So, uh, this little vignette gives you a sense of how we do things on the MOOC. You might be surprised to learn that just plain being awake creates toxic products in your brain. How does the brain get rid of these poisons? Turns out that when you sleep, your brain cells shrink. This causes an increase in the space between your brain cells. It's like unblocking a stream. Fluid can flow past these cells and wash the toxins out. And now, time for a little sleep. So you can do things online that you actually can't do in the classroom, which is kind of fun. And, but there's lots of things going on in that video. 
Do you notice how my hands, I'm gesticulating? Gesticulation in moving my hands, you're, the viewer watches the hands and their mirror neurons fire as a result of that. And in, in some sense, they're repeating the motions and learning more effectively with what you're, what, what you're uh, teaching. So when I hear people say, hey, do a talking head, I'm like, no, don't do a talking head because that cuts you off and that cuts off the gesticulations. And gesticulations are an important part of online learning. So um, other things you'll see, a lot of motion going on in, uh, in the video. So I'll appear on one side, and in some of the videos you'll see, I suddenly appear on the other side. Or I might loom from full standing to you know, a half body or something like that. Motion attracts attention, and we're beginning to understand the neurophysiological pathways that allow that attention to, to uh, be attracted. So, and in particular, looming motion attracts attention a lot because in real life, if something's looming towards you, it could kill you. So it, it, it can be very effective to help, um, help keep viewers' attention on the, uh, on the video if you use good, careful attention to motion. A talking head does not count as motion. It's too predictable. It has to be slightly unpredictable. So there's another aspect of, of sleep I just want to quickly point out that is, is very important for learning. Here is a light microscopy uh, image of a neuron, a living neuron before learning and before sleep. And here is the same exact living neuron after learning and after sleep. And if you look, these little uh, yellow triangles here, those indicate places where new synoptic connections are being formed. So sleep isn't just you know, something you do, it's actually something that not only washes away toxins, but helps create the neural architecture that allows for effective learning. So this is why it's so important to space out learning, to do a little bit every day that rather than to cram it all at once. If you cram it all at once, it makes it so your sort of little metabolic vampires, so to speak, can more easily suck those patterns away. If you're looking for a metaphor, a good one is a brick wall. You lay the brick, lay the mortar, let it dry, and that's how you build a solid wall. If you don't let that mortar dry, you get a sort of a, a, a wreck looking thing. It's, we tend to think when you're learning something that it's just kind of all mush up there and there's not really solid connections being made when you're learning, but that's not true at all. Uh, and this is why spacing out your learning is so, so important. So a quick other little uh, bit of information relates to working memory. We used to think that we had seven, call, call it slots, in working memory. And that is like you could hold seven numbers in working memory. Now we think it's probably more like you can hold four items in your working memory. So uh, in some sense, uh, you know, it's, if you want to keep something in working memory, uh, the best way to do it, to, or if, uh, excuse me, if you want to take something from working memory and put it into long-term memory, the best way to do that is through practice and repeating, right? That's what will allow for this to take place. So I, I like to say practice makes permanent, and what you're really doing is you're building these nice, solid neural pathways. And in some sense, it's like this. First time you practice something, you're creating a pattern, but then the more you practice and repeat, the deeper and richer that pattern can become. So the, the last sort of important uh, item, idea related to learning that I want to convey here today is what, uh, what is known as the theory of chunking. And chunking isn't just sort of dividing things up into bite-sized pieces to communicate it. Ch a chunk in another very, uh, very uh, rich research sense, a chunk is a neural pattern that you create whenever you get some bit of knowledge. 
So, for example, if you have raw information you're introduced to, um, your working memory goes a little crazy. And we can actually see that in, uh, in neural imaging, how your working memory and your prefrontal cortex is going nuts the first time you're trying to figure something out. But once you figure that thing out, uh, you're, you can kind of think of it like this. You figure out what it is. That's my husband right there. Uh, uh, you figure out what it is, and it's like you've created, instead of this glob here, a uh, mass, you've created this little ribbon that you can that pull easily to mind. It's one chunked ribbon, and the other slots of working memory are now left free. So you can uh, put other ideas in there and think about things. This is why sometimes people on tests who haven't studied well, they'll, they'll put these ideas, you know, they'll, they'll try to pull something in mind, and the teacher often has two different ideas they want you to connect together. But if you don't have those ideas chunked into a nice pattern, what happens is you, you, your working memory is all busy. So you can't pull something else in together to make that connection. So that's why chunking uh, and uh, getting ideas, getting patterns into mind is so important. So I'll give you a, a little example of uh, chunking happens in everything. It happens in math and science, happens when you're learning a language, happens when you're doing sports. It happens with our younger daughter. <laughs> so, so we're doing the MOOC. And uh, so the thing is, how do you do it for $5,000 or less? You get cheap support staff from your family. <laughs> so I asked them, I said, hey, look, you know, our two daughters, uh, can somebody model backing up a car badly? So my younger daughter is like, I can do that, right? So what is backing up a car? Backing up a car, if you know how to do it, it's a chunk. When you first learn to back up a car, it's crazy. Your mind's overloaded with too much stuff, right? So when you wa watch her as she backs up the car, and you'll see, she'll be like going crazy. She's, <laughs> it was very easy for her to model this. Uh, and, uh, and it's really difficult when you're first learning how to back up a car. So here she, look at, she's crazy. She's going crazy. It's hard, right? So she backs up the wrong way, and then she backs up the other wrong way. Uh, and so, uh, but again, even something as simple as backing up a car involves the creation of a chunk. You first try it, it's really hard. After a while, it's so easy, you can pull it to mind and be talking to somebody else even as you're backing up the car. It becomes that automatic. So, uh, so, the, so I want to give you just a little bit of a background on how we made the MOOC, right? So this is my basement, except it's a little cleaner than my basement normally is, right? So we created it using a green screen. So you can use any kind of cloth you want for the green screen. You know, it's nothing special. It's just we ordered like for 50 bucks, we got this green cloth from Amazon. And I had no video editing experience, so I went and looked, how do you do a green screen studio you know, uh, on video? And so I learned how to put together a green screen studio. There's some lights there, the three uh, normal lights. I didn't know then that you should probably have four. Uh, but, uh, but it still worked, obviously. And what happens is I stood in front of the, the green screen, and I would be standing there, and, my, uh, and then I would read from the teleprompter, and then I would flub it. And so I'd say, start again, and then I'd flub it, and then I'd, I'd walk off, you know. And, and my husband would be like, he was the guy behind the camera, so he'd be like, oh, okay, stop with the diva moments. Get your butt in here, you know. And uh, so, uh, so what you do is you create this image. It has green behind you you can replace that green stuff with whatever you want, right? Be, you know, so you can have a PowerPoint or something animated. And that's what you saw was a, a, a set of images with the sleep video. So I used the Steve Jobs approach to uh, video uh, creation. 
Steve Jobs had this idea that when you, it used to be when you opened your computer, there, were a, there was a minute or two of startup time. And what Jobs did was he, he would, uh, he said, why is that? I mean, that's really stupid. People around the world are having their time wasted by waiting for boot up time. And, you know, I mean, it's similar for me. People around the world are watching our videos. So I made, took great care to make every single second count when creating the videos. So I may be up there casually cracking a joke, but I'm not going, um, well, I'm thinking about things. And you might think, oh, but the um is important. It allows the viewer to think about things. No, it doesn't, because if I'm saying um before the difficult thing, the viewer wants the pause after the difficult thing. So, so anyway, I tried to make every single second count that was all tightly scripted and, and put together so that even though it seems very casual and very fun, everything is, is carefully planned. So uh, here you see my, uh, my husband. I had uh, first-rate family support in the form of uh, my, my camera, audio, and director. And that's the uh, teleprompter we used. And a thing to realize in any kind of online materials that you create is online is incredibly competitive. So uh, a great educational video is a mixture of academia with Silicon Valley, with a little bit of Hollywood. And of course, when you get to places like Harvard, they say, Hollywood. Oh, you're dumbing it down. But actually, some of the best um, art in the world is, is coming online through, uh, through television nowadays. I do remember one of the worst professors I ever had in my entire life uh, told me once, oh, I never watch television. And uh, I thought, gosh, you know, I don't either. I better start watching. <laughs> so I did, and I, I'm really glad I did, because uh, I think it informed doing the MOOC. So online learning actually can be better than face-to-face. -face. Uh, you can do it either fully online or partly online, as you probably all know, as flipped. Uh, you know, it, 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 especially in the broad-ranging sort of lifestyles that we have today worldwide, um, it, can, uh, it can make learning available that has never been available before, and high-quality learning. So I recently did an article uh, for Nautilus magazine called Virtual Classes Can Be Better Than Real Ones. And, uh, and it just amazes me because a lot of the academic critics of online learning have never taught an online class. So they don't really know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, I, there's, you will be very happy to know that Nature Publishing Group is putting out a new journal. Uh, Nature, of course, is the best group of research journals in the world. Uh, they're based here out of England. And this new journal is going to be called NPG Science of Learning. And it will have, uh, a, it'll actually bring some solid science into how we learn uh, effectively. You, you should know that 0.13% of typical gold standard educational literature is replicated. What that means is you can publish virtually anything you want. Nobody's ever going to check you. So this is part of why the field of education is in such disarray. By bringing nature's perspective in on these articles or in on this research, I think we're going to start seeing dramatic shifts. And my, my co-instructor, Terry Sanowski, uh, uh, for the MOOC, and I have been invited to, to contribute an inaugural article about learning and about MOOCs, so I'm very excited about that. So um, just a, a, a few little um, snippets here. I want to uh, point out that green screen can kind of help reduce cognitive load because it brings everything right in to one area. And again, notice the gesticulation here. Incidentally, both metaphor and analogy are really helpful when you're trying to learn something. So I'm explaining what I explained you before. Remember, a pinball game works by you pull back on the plunger, release it, and a ball goes boinking out, bouncing around on the rubber bumpers, and that's how you get points. So here's your brain. 
with the ears right here and the eyes looking upwards, and we can lay that pinball machine right down inside. So what you see is uh, just a little snippet of what I had explained before, but notice I can stand full body and I can be walking around inside those metaphors. These are the same techniques used by some of the world's most brilliant scientists through history. Barbara McClintock, for example, the, uh, who the, uh, she won the Nobel Prize for her discoveries related to jumping genes. She would imagine herself down in the level of the, the genetics. And that was how she was able to kind of figure some of these things out. Einstein, of course, famously imagined himself riding a light wave. Imagining these kinds of metaphors is an incredibly powerful technique and you can do it in your basement. I mean, it's just that this is all simply PowerPoint, right? And I use Sony Vegas Pro in case you're, I mean, that's like video editing software for dummies. Um, but uh, uh, Sony, uh, or actually um, Adobe Premiere um, is, is really a, a very good software package that people normally use. So here's just a, a little motion with metaphor. Uh, just to give you a little sense of that. And this is to try and explain how to remember um, equations, because we're often told, don't memorize the equation, you can go look it up. No, you want to memorize equations, at least the key equations, because it helps build a neural structure for you, right? Poets, poets will often say, memorize the poem, and you will understand it more deeply. But why should we let the poets have all the fun, right? If you memorize equations or key ideas, it will stick in your mind and you'll think about them more effectively. So I'm trying to teach people silly tools to memorize more easily. F stands for flying, M stands for mule, and A stands for whatever you'd like it to stand for. So here's the, the little video vignette. The idea should be memorable, there's a gigantic flying mule bring F is equal to MA on my couch. Yes, and that is my living room, cleaner than usual in the background there. And, uh, and another very important idea related to online learning, we're used to going to classes and we have students in cages in classes. They can't get away very easily. So we don't have to kind of keep them entertained a little bit. Or humor does more than entertain. It actually relaxes certain areas of the brain and that allows you, when you have something really difficult, you want to do something humorous beforehand because it like makes your brain literally be more open to the new idea. It, it relaxes it. So humor is incredibly important in, uh, in online videos. And that is something that's forgotten at your peril. So here is, this is my co-instructor, Terry Sanowski. He's a legendary neuroscientist. He's one of, one of only 10 living human beings who's simultaneously a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and National Institutes of Medicine for the US. And uh, uh, he's the Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute. And he's actually a really nice guy, but he's so, sort of prestigious that people don't really realize that. So I edited his videos for him. So I'm like, Terry, can I put a little humor in there? He's like, you bet. So here's a little bit of Terry with humor. He's just gone through a very lengthy uh, and deeply scientific discussion of how we learn. And now we move on. This brings us to zombies. Zombies can't learn. It is also clear from their behavior that they have brain damage, especially in the front of their cortex, which is the part that makes plans. So he, he comes right down off his pedestal and he's just fun to be around. And that's a lot of what we try to do in the creation of the MOOC. Of course, you probably all know that uh, good online materials are short. They're about uh, six minutes in length. That's what research shows. Yeah, attention drops off before and after that. Um, uh, I think good online learning actually is changing how we teach because the best materials are now in competition with uh, people teaching online classes. So in that sense, it's important to remember that uh, teachers, uh, professors often get to where they are, teachers get to where they are because they've always been very successful at showing off how much they know. 
but your job as teaching, especially teaching online, is not to show off how much you know, which involves showing how difficult something is before you simplify it. Your, uh, your job is simply to make those ideas simple, clear, and memorable for viewers. So uh, with online materials, I'll just give you a little, uh, a few perspectives here. Sometimes people say, well, MOOCs, you know, they're not that big a deal because people drop out, right? You may have a million viewers, but maybe only uh, 100,000 of them actually finish, you know, the MOOC. But actually, that's, that is, if you look at the statistics, if you took a textbook and looked at that textbook and said, how many people touch the textbook in the store versus how many people actually finish every single chapter in that textbook, you'd say, man, those textbooks have low completion rates. Nobody should be buying textbooks, right? Uh, I mean, just because we have the data of people looking, glancing at a MOOC, doesn't mean that, uh, that people aren't getting a lot out of it from even a simple glance. But a lot of, you can see uh, from this person here, she says, I don't need the certificate. I won't take the quizzes. Given that, I don't want to leave the impression that everyone who signs up and follows that path is simply not finishing or getting thing, anything out of it. I am, in fact, getting a great deal out of the course. So a lot of people who are just kind of watching a few videos, they're still getting things that are very worthwhile for them. Uh, as far as uh, people often say, well, online, you can't really impact people. They're not really paying attention. That's not true either. Um, good materials can catch people from all over the world. Uh, but this is, this is like one of the funniest ones. So this is our older daughter. She is uh, just wrapping up medical school. And so I had, I asked her to, and she was a good sport about it, I just asked her to model um, just wearing headphones to block out sound. So she has these kind of small little uh, headphones. Turns out she's got these big honking headphones on her lap, so she models how you block out sound if you're really learning something difficult. She was in class, uh, sitting pretty much like this. Uh, her professor was uh, speaking to them. He suddenly stopped the class. Uh, he's a preeminent cardiologist in Southeast Michigan. Stops the class points directly at her and says, you, you're the girl of the video. You're in the MOOC. <laughs> uh, so, so even preeminent cardiologists uh, I, I actually take these materials. Um, and then that contrasts that with, here's uh, an email we got from a fifth grader. So that would be like somebody about 13, 12, 13 years old. Uh, I'm in grade five. My mom was browsing through Coursera, and I pestered her to make me join in. Uh, she chose this course for me. I'm very thankful for that. I never knew that professors were very witty. I'm like, of course I'm witty. I scripted it in, damn it, you know. Uh, um, but uh, the course is also used in uh, refugee camps in Somalia and the southern Sudan. Uh, it's, uh, it's used in uh, penitentiaries in the uh, state of California. It's also, uh, I just met with some people in Colorado. They're using it for, to help educate people with IQs of 70 and below who had always been sort of put on the sidelines before. Uh, they, they'd never been able to go into any kind of professional work. They're, some of these kids are now attending college. So learning how to learn can make an immense difference in all sorts of people's lives. Uh, and the personal nature of good online learning can make a big impact. Uh, so here's a, a letter uh, from someone who says she uh, took the MOOC, and for me it was life-changing. Uh, she's currently studying a MOOC on mathematical modeling. The old me would have given up after the first or second week. The new me is on course for honors. So it can make a big difference. Uh, here's one that says uh, just basically, and it's not me, it, and it's not my co-instructor. It, it's, it's these new kinds of materials and way of reach, ways of reaching out. And this is something truly that is available for all of us to do. Again, it's not rocket science. You want to know what I did when I got stuck in creating the MOOC? 
I went and asked a local high school kid, <laughs> right? They, they knew how to create these materials. It's really, it's not hard, and it's all inexpensively available. So the biggest thing that we can be doing now is, I think, just sharing our own excitement uh, and enthusiasm for learning. That's, that's why we're here. And I think, in closing, what I'd just like to say involves the idea of passion. We're often taught, follow your passion. And the thing about passion, though, is it is truly a double-edged sword. Passions develop about what you're good at. And some, some things take much longer to get good at. So I always say, don't just follow your passions. Broaden your passions, and your lives will be greatly enriched. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. That was a very insightful talk, very interesting. I, I love your honesty through, through the presentation. Um, absolutely wonderful to hear. So before I open up for questions and comments um, and anything around that, I, I just want you to do a, a quick thing with, you, with people that are sitting around. And just what was, what was important for you? What did you think that was useful? Just that talk for a moment amongst each other. Just what did you think was useful? What did you think was important about what you heard from Barbara? So please just do that, and then I'll get your attention back. So just be, but I, I just want people to talk, and then I'll get you comments. Yeah. Well done, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah. Have you had some water? That was a lot of talking. Yes, you did. I did. I did. Good. I did. Hopefully, did I run okay as far as time? Yeah, it's fine. We've got about eight minutes left, so. Okay. That's so fine. a few questions. Yeah, yeah. I we'll kept kind of time. looking over. I was like, I know I'm going on a bit yeah. longer than Yeah, you're I thought. okay. It's okay. all right. Yeah. And you were, I would you have shut you up. Like, yeah. No, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite a lot of different pieces there. I, I remember the pieces where you were talking about working memory and chunking. I remember that from my psychology days of learning, and what yeah, and um, it's interesting to hear kind of the updated thinking around that actually, mm -hmm. and what, what that's telling us now as well. Mm -hmm. That was nice to hear about. Oh, that's good, good stuff. Thank good. you. Yeah, to me, chunking is one of the most important things, but educators rarely talk about it. Yeah. And I think the reason is because it would completely run counter to the way they teach in yeah. math and science. Yeah. So as long as they stay away from that. They're safe. <laughs> yeah, they're safe, yeah. But that means that okay. a very important idea is Yeah, best. it's true. Right, can I get your attention, please? Thank you very much. So we have, uh, we have two roving mics uh, on either side of the room. Uh, so if you do have a comment or a question for Barbara, then just uh, I'm, I'm afraid you have to do the hands up thing, so please do, and then we'll try and get around. So we've got somebody over there, and we've got somebody over here. Whoever gets it first goes. Go! Hi, uh, I'm program manager at a business school, and I was wondering how can I implement the. Is it possible to create a diffuse state within a classroom or outside the classroom? How can you develop a program that um, takes that into mind? Okay, so the question is how do you develop a, a, or implement some diffuse activities in the classroom? Uh, my sense is that the best way to do that is through active learning. So, for example, when we took a break and you switch your attention, it's, you're switching your attention to someone else, but it's a much more relaxed state. So, uh, you know, it's not like you're really focusing on me trying to fo follow. It's more like, oh, okay, now what do we think? And uh, if you use the same trick, usually when, when they do that to me and I'm in the audience, I'm like, you go first. <laughs> you, you speak first. So I, I can just like relax and kind of think about things. But I, I think this is part of why active learning is such a powerful technique in the classroom. 
Um, and that's my, my best um, recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Over there. Um, I, I'm frequently asked to make e-learning modules um, in a corporate environment. Uh, some of these are quite complex on something like tax or audit, um, or completely new learning, very technical. And some people say, well, that's going to take at least an hour, perhaps three hours. And, and I'm thinking, no way, Jose, that's far, far too long. Is there, in your opinion, an optimum time for, for learning in, of that nature? Um, six minutes is really <laughs> so so uh, you know the, uh, i mean i'm an uh, I, I teach engineering so i know that you can't communicate everything in six minutes right but what you can do is you can create little scripts six minute chunk of an idea six minute now maybe some of them will be three maybe some of them will go up to seven eight or nine but you can keep them pretty restricted because you're giving one idea if you're trying if you're instructors are trying to communicate this big broad thing all at once they're going to lose everybody but if they give a chunk a chunk a chunk you know in the sense of breaking things up uh, but also each one is a neural chunk then then towards the end they can bring those chunks together and it will make much more sense i know exactly what you mean um professors i think the the biggest challenge is professors think they know it all. And, and you're, or as people who are experts, and they often don't realize there is a way to, to break things down and communicate it more briefly. It's as Pascal once said, something along the lines of, you know, if I had more time, I would explain more briefly. Um, it, because it's difficult. To, but that's where good scripting can really, if you take a script and say, you know, get the person to write the script and then say, hey, look, this is, you know, 50 minutes. There's a little part right there. Hey, you can kind of tweak that around so it's got a beginning and end and then do it like that. Um, sometimes you'll need an expert to go in and say, hey, buddy, you, gotta, you can do it. Uh, you can do it shorter. Um, because they won't believe you, um, but uh, then find that person who can frame the idea that it is, because absolutely, you can do it with anything. Create small chunks and then tie it all together at the end. Thank you. Who else, please? Uh, uh, a lady there and somebody down over there. Yes, uh, lady in the white, just there. Will I go? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier on that online learning can be better than in the classroom. Then if that's the case, then why, why are we all here? Okay. If you look at all teaching, it is a statistical truism to say that 50% of all teachers are below average. Right? So why do we have those 50% of really bad teachers out there? I mean, um, I, I'm being a little facetious here. There are, uh, there, a good teacher, uh, the best of all education is if you have world-class teachers getting world-class students together, you know, so I mean, like the world-class students here. Like what's happening now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you're all able to kind of talk. That is the best. Mm. But a lot of times that's simply not available. If, if you, I was in Guatemala uh, last week, and so uh, they can't get professors to come to Guatemala. Uh, they'll, they'll get them, they'll sign up, and then they'll look and they'll say, hey, it's too dangerous. It's not really too dangerous, but you know, they'll be put off. So they just won't come. Mm. So uh, um, what I'm really trying to say is simply, uh, a lot of times y you can't get the very best, so you kind of go for the second best, but, but it actually can have really good trade-offs that can make it really pretty much the same in, in many ways as, as good face-to-face -face kinds of experiences. You know, I love, I, there's, learning comes in a lot of different ways, and so you know, I wouldn't trade the interaction of a conference like this 
But at the same time, I certainly, uh, I think that online materials like what we can create is a, a really a boon for people too. Thank you. Great question. Right. Um, thank you for an extremely interesting talk. Um, I've done a lot of work in safety critical industries. And one of the important things is to do the analysis properly so that, like on your slide with the brick wall, you got all the bricks. One of the ways that I feel rather um, upset, shall we say, is that too often you get given a, a manual and told to do some e-learning on that, even if it is having to be chunked into six minute bits. You need to know you get the right chunks. How do you make sure that that happens now when the analysis, analysis phase out of the old style Addy approach has gone? That, that's a difficult question to answer because I think it varies so much by what is being taught. Certainly for me, I mean, somewhat analogous is the whole idea of uh, learning how to learn in the first place. Um, there, there's just so many different aspects of it. How can you tie together that, uh, for example, some of the top review papers on how you learn effectively talk about deliberate practice, interleaving, and talking amongst other people as the keys to learning effectively. But I've just presented all sorts of other ideas. Chunking, uh, the importance of sleep, how, how um, you know, uh, just all these different ideas, and they aren't even included. So the, I think going back to the crux of your question, it's all in how the material is created in the first place, and you, and you wanna have a really good person drawing that together and creating a learning experience, whether online or in person, that is that brings together some of the you know amorphous things that you're trying. So it really goes back to who that um, content creator is. Um, I don't know if that really because your question is such a, a good one and a difficult one to answer, but that would be my best uh, way of addressing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for any further questions. Uh, we're at the end of the time for the session. Thank you.